Let your voice be heard in this piece of earth, carrying your words, the thoughts of the Most High, that are current with you, Lord, that would indicate where your heart is and what we are to understand if we are to be aligned with you. So come, Lord, and redeem this occasion preciously, not only as if you're addressing this church, but as if this church was somehow a statement of the church at large, and the word that goes here will go there. The word, my God, that is appropriate in your own precious sight as the head over the church, the apostle of our confession, prophet, priest, and king. Come, Lord, precious God, and do and say and perform all these things to your own delight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. There's a little message that I've composed. I think the Lord wants you to speak from it. Originally called Israel and the Church, the issue of contemporary worship. You say, what does contemporary worship have to do with Israel and the Church? And my answer is, as I hope you'll see and understand everything. There's a remarkable, complex jointedness between what goes on in our services and how we are relating to the people Israel. I know it sounds like remote consideration, but this is the way that the Lord has given me to see, and I hope to communicate this. I've noticed in recent years a certain tendency upon the, on the part of the charismatic or Pentecostal church to invoke the presence of God, as if it's something that we can command or perform at will. It makes me very uncomfortable. I appreciate the presence of God, but I think we need to revere the God whose presence we're seeking and to know it's not that we cannot manipulate Him. It's for Him to manipulate us. So someone has written, those times when they come are the gift of God entirely. You cannot give them to yourself when you choose. We are in God's presence by God's act and not by any performing thing of our own. Not only can you not compel God, you should not seek to compel God, because we've already betrayed something in our understanding and our mentality that is inappropriate as the church. Whatever is self-initiated, however well-meaning the motive, is not of God. Whatever is of self is of self. Whatever is of self of flesh is flesh. And that does not alter when the thing that we want and we're initiating out of ourselves, we think to be spiritual or we think to be desired because it comes under the umbrella of what we call worship. It's in the area of worship that I feel that we're running the greatest dangers and risking the loss of the most significant things. So he alone is the creator king and who dispenses what he wills, when he wills, from the throne of heaven. So the issue of God himself commending his own presence is the issue of what issues from the throne. And if we are not conscious of the enthronement of God and what can only come from him as he will, when he wills, we have not a proper recognition of the sovereignty of God and the enthronement of God, which will profoundly affect how we see every issue. If we lose God on the throne and, and allow it to become only a kind of phrase without a real cognizance that everything issues from him, it's a serious erosion and threat to authentic faith, authentic believing, authentic church. There needs to be a heightened sense of the throne of God who reigns from the heavens, not only bringing down as he wills his presence, but bringing down as he wills his judgments, his, his trials, his times of difficulty, the dark days and the things through which we sometimes are required to pass and I believe must be required to pass. We mustn't lose the sense of God's enthronement. And at any time that we initiate something out of ourselves, even invoking the name of God or thinking ostensibly it's for God, we move dangerously away from that recognition of God on the throne. The issue of Israel is the issue of God on the throne. The king is contained in the heavens, it says, 
waiting for the restoration of all things spoken by the prophets since the world began. Waiting for what? Waiting to come down and take his place at Zion on the throne of David as the son of David, that he might rule over the house of Israel and through the house of Israel all nations and all of creation forever. Do you know that? I could stop right now and you've received your money's worth. Do you know that? If you know that, you know much. But if you don't know that, or you hold it only as a kind of brittle uh, truth or doctrine, but don't know in your deeps the great mystery of the enthronement of God and his rule over creation out of Zion, you don't know what is at the heart of the whole faith and the purpose for the church and its being. So I'm jealous over the fulfillment of the thing for which God is presently contained in the heavens, waiting for the, for the restoration of all things spoken by the prophets. And you know what the prophets spoke? Not a word about the church being restored, Israel being restored. That he might come, as he said, you'll not see me, it says, you shall say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. But when they shall see him, they shall see him as king. And in the same city where he was crucified, under the mocking sign in three languages, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews, there the Father will establish him in glory to receive what is due him in the very place where he was mocked and executed. You've got to see this, dear saints. I mean, really see it, really long for it, really expect it, and really understand that any failure to recognize his enthronement, any self-serving, self-initiating act on our part sets back the realization of himself as king from that place over all the earth. That the praise of God might go to the ends of the earth and the nations come up to Jerusalem to honor the nation which God has honored. Not because it's deserving, but because he has elected and chosen them that the law might go forth out of Zion and the word of the Lord out of Jerusalem. I'm giving you simple, basic, doctrinal truths. The thing that makes them unusual or novel is that we're not hearing them. The church has lost this consciousness of the issue of the throne, of the issue of rule, of the issue of the kingdom of God as the rule of God, as the theocratic authority of God issuing from the place we, which he has appointed because it's weak and because it's foolish. It's called Jerusalem and the holy hill of Zion. We have to live as if we believe that and as if our own present government is, from his, is upon his shoulder and from that throne. Now, when we initiate, again I'm repeating myself, any self-initiating activity, any self-determination, I'm going to marry this one, take that for career, go to school, retire, without consulting the king from the throne is an affront to his sovereignty and to his authority and deflects and deters his coming and his realization in the earth. So what we do in the church is very much an issue of this kind. So if we have to wait what comes from the throne that we cannot initiate, that waiting is itself the priestly character of the church. To wait is a priestly disposition. And few of us have any awareness of it, let alone have come into it, or think that it's desirable. This is not a generation to wait. This is the now generation that is instant and wants it now. To wait is priestly. And if we cannot initiate and can only receive what comes down from the throne of heaven, it requires our waiting. And that willing waiting has everything to do with the very essence of the character of the church that makes it the church and not just the general conglomeration of souls who are coming for services or for their enjoyment. Am I speaking over your heads? Am I raising too high a standard? This is the, this is the jealousy uh, of the prophetic call to restore or to set forth verbally the image, the, the design of God that is lost and necessarily becomes diffused and weakened and the consciousness of it is lost and we fall into something else and we see the same uh, condition everywhere so it's a question of doing it a little better than the guy down the block 
Our worship is a little better, but the question is, is it self-initiated or given? Are we waiting? Have we the patience to wait? Will we grow restless in waiting? Will we, des- will we desire to go down the street that does not wait and can turn it on and give it to you now? I'm saying that the issue is momentous and enormous. If we have any desire to glorify God and to be the church that is the church that will move Jews to jealousy, which is our mandate, and fulfill all the things that bring his coming and his establishment and his enthronement at Zion, we will be willing for the sacrifice of waiting. I had a burden for Germany. Germany, the, the land that perpetrated the Holocaust against Jews to the tune of six million Jewish lives and a million and a half children, I had a call for Germany seven years before the Lord ever allowed me to open my mouth to address them. And I passed through the nation on several occasions, living next door in Denmark, but I had not the liberty to initiate out of myself the fulfillment of the very um, vision that God had given me for Germany. It was not yet the time. And the, you say, well, why does God give a vision for something years in advance of its employment? Because there's something for the prophet in holding a vision, waiting for the release from the throne, rather than going off on his own to perform it. It does an interior work of a kind that when the moment does come of God's release, that word has a gravity and a weight and a penetration that saves it from being a novelty or an amusement and makes it an event. Got the idea? You say, well, that's your calling. No, it's your calling. All the church is called to propheticness. All the church is called to that which is priestly. For Jesus was high priest and the apostle of our confession. And to the degree that he was not a priest, neither was he apostle. To the degree that we are not priestly in our willingness to wait and patient and do not commandeer or usurp or initiate, to that degree we will have prophetic and apostolic calling, authority, and fulfillment. Is that your desire? You'll be tested. I'll tell you what, waiting is excruciating. The silences are deadly, and your flesh palpitates to hear something, see something, perform something, because the whole of the world in which we live is based on voluptuous sensuality, to see, to hear, to do. To wait is a form of dying, but out of death and the suffering of waiting comes glory. Imagine speaking that to young people, when everything in their age is now itched, do perform. So priestly waiting upon him is that profound respect and acknowledgement which is at the very heart and foundation of ourselves as the church. Here, the whole game is won or lost. If we have not a disposition for priestly waiting, we need not consider any other aspect of that which constitutes authentic apostolic reality. This is the first Because it's not a waiting because It's a requirement, I guess, we got to. It's an obligation. It's a waiting out of reverent respect for God, who is the creator, who in the beginning spoke and said, let there be. It's an acknowledgement, except that something issues from him, it had better not issue from us. For out of us is no good thing at all. So the issue of waiting is the issue of a certain kind of cognizance, a certain kind of deep respect and reverence for God alone. Who, ha- who, who, being God, is the only one who has the right to initiate anything at his time and at his will. And until that comes, we would rather wait than germinate or, f- what's the word, produce, fabricate something like it, but not the thing in itself. Remember when in Exodus where the formula is given for the holy anointing oil? God is precise in its requirement. Take a certain measure of this spice and a certain measure of that spice and grind it very small and temper it in the, in the pestle in the mortar. Break it up where you can't even distinguish the one element from the other and add oil of a certain dimension. And this is the holy anointing oil and God says, and make not anything else like it and be sure and that it's not poured out on man's flesh. So that indicates that there's always the prospect 
particularly in an age of technology, of making something like it. It sounds like it, it gives the appearance of it, we enjoy it, it seems to give a sense of something. Isn't that his presence? How do we know who have never waited? So I'm, I'm cautioning the whole church through you and yourselves to wait. Wait for the real thing, for once it comes. It has not to do anymore with our desire, our pleasure. It's the manifestation of a God who honors a people who wait upon him in priestly dependency. And if we have not that as our foundation, what can follow? Every visitation of God is a mercy. You believe that? In a word, we do not deserve anything. God is not under obligation to perform anything, to give anything, to bless anything. If we receive blessing, it's pure mercy. You say, oh, why is that so important to understand? Because mercy is at the heart of God's mystery. That he's going to conclude all in his mercy in the last days. That by your mercy, they will receive mercy. But if you yourself are unaccustomed to recognizing mercy and take for granted the things that come or perform them yourself in, a, in substitution for the mercy that gives from the throne, how shall you have a mercy yourself to extend? Thank God that this is being taped, because these statements need to be heard several times over. All I can do is be wrung out before you. I can't, and Pastor has given me a liberal amount of time. Don't in any way or think yourself restricted. Take full time, full liberty. We'll put you on early. Thank you for that. But I would need days and weeks to explicate in, in full what's on my heart. I'm giving you the word mercy. Because mercy is the very quintessence of what God is in himself. When, when Moses said, show me your glory, God showed him his mercy. For his mercy is his glory. But do you know it? Are you the recipients of his mercy? Are you consciously receiving his mercy? Do you understand that tonight is a mercy? Do you know as well as I that my speaking is pure mercy or there's no speaking at all? That I have no ability in myself? I'm not a jack-in-the-box or a piece of, uh, of eloquence and articulation that can turn it on and off at will. If the mercy of God is not being extended, I can't even begin to formulate thoughts like these. You need to recognize the mercy of God as gift. Because if you'll not recognize it and not receive it as mercy, how shall you have a mercy to extend? Because the end of the age is that by your mercy they may obtain mercy. I'm touching the very heart of God here, you dear saints, and the very mystery of God. And the whole issue is determined in the, in, the, uh, in the assembly of the saints and in our ordinary Sunday services. This is what I'm trying to show you. There's a conjunction between how we conduct and deport ourselves in our Sunday services and the fulfillment of the ultimate mystery for which God has intended the church and given the church, that it might extend mercy. And I can tell you this. Though you may not have any sense of it, and Jews now move you to envy by their prosperity, the day is soon coming when the wealthiest of Jews will find themselves with no more than the shirt on their back if they have even that much. That when the Jews were expelled out of Berlin in the very beginning of the Hitler persecution, out of their apartments, out of their homes, out of their professions, they were judges, they were lawyers, they were publishers, they were editors, they were professionals, they were doctors. Out in a day, the loss of their title, the loss of their privilege, the loss of their income, the loss of their homes. People who had some sympathy would drive by the ditch where they were cowering without even a coat and throw them a coat, throw them a blanket, throw them a, a paper bag of some food. You couldn't even be caught extending that or you would suffer with them. I want to say, dear saints, that's a preview of things to come. If they don't receive mercy from us, in the final extremity of the time of Jacob's trouble, they will perish. And their perishing altogether forbids the fulfillment of the mystery of the Lord's coming as king, for he waits for the redeemed of the Lord to return to Zion. <coughs> and there'll be no return. There'll be no survival, except that Jews worldwide in the time of Jacob's trouble will receive a mercy from people who are able to extend it because they know that their whole Christian life is predicated upon the mercy of God. You don't have to wait for some untoward occasion where you break your leg, your neck, or a family, or, or something uh, in the hospital is sick. Every day is a mercy. His mercies are new 
every morning. But do you know that? Really know that? Really live by the mercies of God? Or do you, or do you choose not to be so dependent? You'd rather be self-sufficient yourself. Yes, when the mercy comes, that's nice. But if it doesn't come, I can take care of this situation. I've got a college degree. I graduated high school. I've got a profession, occupation. I've got money in the bank. I've got plans. Mercy. You don't have anything except by the mercy of God. It needs to come into our consciousness so that everything that comes to us, even in a Sunday service, is a mercy. The preaching, the fellowship, the communion, the worship, the taking of the bread and the wine, it's a mercy. It's a gift. It comes down from above, from the throne of heaven. That we might extend mercy having received it is the mystery of Israel and the church of which Paul says he would not have us to be ignorant. That church which is ignorant or indifferent to that crucial mandate forfeits its apostolic credential as the church. What are you saying, God? I'm saying this, that in almost 40 years as a believer and traveling the world in the service of God, I have come to the conclusion that the absence of the mystery of, the, of Israel and the church when it is forfeited or not known and not desired, will cripple and stunt any church and keep it from its apostolic fulfillment. This mystery and the recognition of it is the key to our life and service with God. You say, but I have no interest in them. That's exactly the point. Being Gentile, it's not natural for you to have such an interest let alone to extend yourself for those whom you have only envied at a distance or even been irritated. That is all the more to the glory of God when you are doing something that is not in keeping with your self-interest but has to do with another. But if your self-interest is being affected in your Sunday services and don't think that this is a dynamic that goes on in churches everywhere where the pastor, his colleagues, want to produce and to perform that which will gratify the congregation so that no member of it be lost, when that is even unconscious in our motivation, it has man as its object rather than God. We have got to come to a place where our self-interest is not the foremost consideration for our being, but the interest of God, which in his own wisdom has called us to be to the Jews, what we never ourselves would have chosen, and which we could never ourselves perform, except that there's a grace that is given. Don't think that we Jews have any easier time with our own people than you. Sometimes it's even more difficult being Jewish. My mother, what a trial she was. The fact that I'm her son, and a Jewish son, does not make my relationship with her any more possible, except for the grace which is given as a gift from the throne of heaven, moment by moment, till finally in her 96th year, she threw in the towel and followed me in a prayer to receive the Lord, whom she had resisted for 38 years. It was a gift. So that we reveal and violate every Sunday when we automatically initiate our own worship through amplified sound instrumentation. You see the temptation? We have the the technological wherewithal to create impressive sound and voices and coupled together, we can simulate, emulate, and bring forth a kind of an impression that's enjoyable, but is it unto God? Is it initiated by Him? Have we waited for that release? Are we moving in our own self-initiation rather than waiting for the gift of worship? For who can worship God but God? Who can love God but God? One of the most profound things I ever heard in all of our years in community is when one of our young brothers said, it takes God to love God. Whew. Where do we get the presumption to think that we can perform or express something that will gratify his soul? It has got to come down to us that it might come up from us. It requires a waiting and a dependency which is humiliating all the more when that waiting can become edgy and nothing is happening. And shouldn't it be happening? Isn't that what we're here for? And after all, we've had a hard week at the office or the factory, and we've come for something. And if it's not forthcoming, we can go elsewhere. Well, something is wrong in the way things are constituted, that you're coming for a Sunday fix, 
because there's not been through the week that has preceded Sunday that normative and loving and devotional relationship with the Lord that does not have to be made up on a Sunday morning alone. It's like putting the entire premium on sex in marriage that if you don't have a gangbuster breakthrough, there's a deflatedness. No, if there's a continual love, a continual affection, a continual endearment, sex, yes, precious, God-given, but it's not made the whole thing in itself that if somehow it doesn't come out right, we're deflated, we're disappointed, and we begin to look for another partner. The same thing is true in the issue of church and worship. What we need in order to relieve the responsibility of making Sunday morning a big payoff and that we know that we're in church is that we have been in church all through the week. We've been in communion with God. We've been up early. We've had a time in the Psalms and in prayer where he's on our lips, he's in our heart, at work and at play. Sunday is just a culmination, it's a celebration of that which we have been acknowledging all the week long, not a payoff for a week's neglect. So the whole way in which things are constituted work against the mystery of God in which the church is the very laboratory. So we must wait for that which is sent from heaven. And the word sent you, dear saints, is at the root of the Greek word apostolic. An apostle is a sent one. An apostolic church is a sending body. And if I'm not sent from that reality in northern Minnesota, however few its members, however shabby their appearance, however unimpressive the outward form of our life, you'll get nothing from me. A sent one has to be sent from a sending body. But here's the catch. We need to exalt the word sent. Jesus said, as the Father has sent me, so send I you. Except something is sent, it's nothing. Unless I'm a sent one, with a sent word, what then are we receiving this evening? And I'll tell you what, I've come to a place long before tonight where I don't want to speak or to be employed unless I'm the bearer of a sent word as one sent from a sending body. I'd rather be something else or nothing else than, than I should be, with, uh, be kept from this privileged use. So you're not going to come to that place unless it is privileged, unless you regard it for the holy thing that it is, unless that the word apostolic makes the juices to run in your mouth and has long uh, since put in the shade the word charismatic, Pentecostal, evangelical, or any other lesser thing. The word apostolic is ultimate, for the church is built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. But what are these men? They're sent ones, bearing sent words, out from sending congregations who revere what it means to be sent, because they wait for that which is sent from heaven, because they don't initiate for themselves what can only come from above when he will give it as gift. So are you beginning to get the picture? That the very dynamic of how we conduct ourselves Sunday by Sunday, and we can have another mode altogether, that no one will ever fault and people will even admire because it's done so artfully and so well. But it's not this that I'm holding up for you. That has to do with the genius of what God intends for the church that is the church. And the church alone that can fulfill the mandate of God. Moving Israel to jealousy. Extending mercy. That there might be the redeemed of the Lord returning to Zion. That brings the king from heaven to Zion. The stakes are enormous. And is being worked out every sun Sunday by Sunday. And we have to be careful of the, our practices, the atmosphere, the way in which we imitate, reflect what is current. Only doing, a little bit, doing it a little bit better, a little bit more enjoyably, but unwilling to recognize what is at stake in the issue of no, waiting for what comes from above, from the throne of heaven, as sent and received, as gift and as mercy. All of the great words that constitute apostolic faith and reality, I have just now expressed to you, and they are before us as option in how we act and perceive and conduct ourselves Sunday by Sunday. I have never seen this before as I'm seeing it now and speaking it now for a first time. I spoke this once before in Brooklyn, just before I left to come back to Minnesota, but before I left left to come back to Minnesota, 
I wrote a letter to the pastor. Because he calls himself an apostle. And I said, you dear man, I'm not impressed that you really heard and understood what was spoken. Because the moment that I finished and you came up on the platform, you reverted back to your pastoral style as if the word was only a commonplace and not a now rhema word from God of an ultimate and challenging kind. And I want you to know that your whole, the issue of your own apostolic calling rests in your receiving the word that came to you as sent. For if you'll not receive it as a sent word from a sent one, how shall you yourself be sent? How shall you yourself be apostolic? Or what you think is your call will become only a title, an honorific kind of thing in the way in which increasingly we're seeing now, doctor so on, doctor so on, apostle this, prophet that. The title has lost its cogency. It's become an empty thing. And I tell you, dear saints, when the word apostle and prophet becomes an empty thing, we are finished. We are apostate more than we know. We have to be so jealous over this reality. And I'm saying to this pastor in the letter, you can pray for him, that when I come back to New York, I'll find an answer from him that says, you're right, Art. I did neglect that word. I didn't even like it. It threatened the way in which we ordinarily conduct ourselves. And it's more important for me to see that we keep the ship going as it is, that we should take the risk of this apostolic daring for the reality that you're commending to us, because we have to confess, we're not all that much concerned with Jews anyway, though we're in Brooklyn, New York, in the city of two and a half million Jews. I'd rather hear that from him than I should hear nothing. I'll tell you, dear saints, after almost 40 years in the faith worldwide, you name it, India, Indonesia, Singapore, I've been everywhere, Egypt, China, that I've never seen God more earnest, more contending, more insistent for the real thing that I'm seeing him now. And I'm seeing separation, sifting, God uh, removing those who have not a heart for this and becoming very focused on what was his intention originally, which we have long ignored and not known, must in the end be fulfilled by just the kind of jealous care that I'm describing to you for the respect for the word which, of what is divinely given as sent. How you view me tonight and how you hear me tonight will be critical for all your future. If you just think this is some guy doing his thing, speaking his own pet preference, and it was interesting for an evening, but let's go back to things as they were. You will have missed a timed occasion from God that may not be given again. I'm not saying anything like that to exalt myself, but I know that God is that earnest now, and I believe that this is that occasion for you. And he'll step aside if he's overrun. You, you insist on doing your thing? He'll, he's a gentleman. He'll not contend with you. He'll allow himself to be displaced. And our flesh clamors all the more to fabricate the sense of his presence. And, and we will be satisfied with that in our souls while our spirit is denied and atrophies in the very process. What are you saying, God? I'm saying this. That if we will, if we will accept on a continual basis a soulish, humanly fabricated alternative to that which is authentic and only comes down as scent, it's not that you have lost something, it's that you have suffered a permanent loss. There is a debility, there's an erosion in your spirit. Soul is strengthened, spirit is weakened, so that your discernments are less and less capable of even distinguishing between soul and spirit. If you are satisfied at the soul level, your spirit will suffer decline. So be jealous and be able to distinguish the one from the other. And though we might fabricate soulish things, we cannot fabricate spirit things. Spirit is given. Spirit is sent. Spirit comes down from above. And how then shall we move Jews to jealousy? What are we going to show them? That we can perform church as expertly as they perform synagogue? Or are they going to see something that has all of the earmarks of heaven because it has come down from above? by a people who have waited for it and are jealous for that they will not accept the substitute for unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus world without end throughout all ages our characteristic Sunday manner however well performed betrays us and reveals the truth of our condition that the enemy sees and can continue to boast 
Jesus I know and Paul I know, but who are you? I want you to know that you're being observed. That the powers of the air that brood over Kansas, over the Midwest, over the nation, know who it is that they're obliged to fear. They know who it is who's earnest with God. They know who it is who is jealous for his glory and for his honor. They know who it is who can be easily wooed and surrendered to something less than other that does not in any way disturb them, and they would even give every encouragement for you to continue in those things. Jesus we know. He's the real thing. Paul we know. He's the very explication and continuation of the authenticity of Jesus. But who are you? And I want to say to you, if you'll understand it, how the powers of darkness regard us is more critical than how men will regard us and more critical than how we will regard ourselves. That they should count us as something to be concerned about and fearful, something that threatens the kingdom of darkness because we are eminently in the kingdom of light and, and in the heavenly things, is the critical issue of what Paul speaks of in Ephesians chapter 3, that God has created all things in order through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might be demonstrated to the principalities and the powers of the air. And this is the eternal purpose of God in Christ Jesus. Well, it's more than I can tell you now, but it's in my book, Apostolic Foundations. The chapter on the principalities and powers of the air is worth the whole price of that book. And how many Christians are there? How many churches are there that are conducting themselves in conscious awareness that there's a drama taking place of enormous proportions before the spread of an invisible realm of spirit authority called the principalities and the powers of the air. And that for them to recognize us and to be fearful of us is critical even to the release of their influence over the whole locality where we ourselves are. So how we conduct ourselves and deport ourselves is observed by them whether we regard the things that come down from above as precious, worth waiting for, and worth even risking religious failure to obtain, rather than we ourselves should bring about a similitude of those things which they themselves like. Because it keeps us from being ourselves a sending body. Because we have not waited for what is sent. Because we have not respected the word sent. We have no apostolic consciousness. We're satisfied with good services. We don't see the issue of what needs to be expressed in the world apostolically in the authority and power of God by those who are sent from ascending body who waits and recognizes and reveres that which is sent and comes down from above as gift. That would, that's what terrifies them. They were terrified by Paul because Paul was a sent one. He was an apostle. He bore the authority of God. He moved in the life and power of the Most High. He did not initiate anything out of himself. That we should be recognized as formidable and feared by the powers of darkness is more to be desired than the acceptance or even of the enjoyment of men. We have no greater sense of the cosmic struggle against the powers of the air then we do the mystery of Israel, for the two are inextricably joined. Sorry for a fancy statement like that, but I have to put it on the tape. You have no better knowledge of the mystery of the principality and the powers of the air, and the reason for which God has created all things, in order that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might be demonstrated to this invisible spectral realm, than you have of the issue of the mystery of Israel, of which Paul says, I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, lest you become wise in your own conceit. After 40 years I have seen this, that the church that does not understand the one doesn't understand the other. The church that does understands both and is a formidable threat to those powers because it's taking up the mandate of God for a people who would be despised worldwide and are willing to relate to them in a sacrificial way. And in doing that, they are manifesting the very wisdom of God. To be to the Jew what we ought, when it does not serve our self-interest and threatens our self-interest for people with whom, whom we would not ourselves have chosen merely because they are chosen of him and have a destiny in him and we're willing to even at the risk of our life and peril to be an aid to them, that very willingness is itself the wisdom that whole mindset 
a whole way of perceiving reality and to show you that the issue itself is being every Sunday either being advanced or, or retracted. We need to be conscious that what takes place in the ordinary affairs that constitute our fellowship have everything to do with the fulfillment of the one or its loss. So it's the issue of reality itself. Reality is at stake when we construe or form something, uh, thinking, that, thinking it to be the presence of God, the counterfeit that we have sweatily created with ear-splitting volume and beat in the ostensible ecstatic faces of our worship leaders who evidently are being carried away in repeating mantras. <laughs> well, excuse me, this is me getting carried away. You know what I'm saying? There's something about the worship leaders, as I sat in this same brother's church, and I watched the worship team and the leaders, and the ecstatic um, sense of God that they seem to exhibit. I thought, wow, I have no sense of that myself. Where do, where do they have it? Maybe the very act of leading in choruses encourages this kind of expression. Or is there an unconscious kind of pressure being visible before an entire congregation that sort of compels us to t adopt a certain kind of appearance of ecstatic reverie when we are not, in fact, experiencing the same. I'll tell you what, I'm not uh, indicting any of your precious children here or on the platform, but I want to say to them, you're at the greatest risk. And it's not your fault. There's something of the whole format of the church that brings you in a place to be visible and to inspire the others by watching you. But if you are not authentically in that reverential mood and are yourself being primed or cued to it, it is essentially false. It's no longer true. It's no longer real. And the issue of reality itself is being lost. And if we lose it in worship, where do we have it anywhere? I'd rather, I'd rather hear a worship uh, leader say, I don't have it today. I'm out of sorts. I, uh, this went wrong or that. I, I, I can't perform. Please forgive me. I, I have to sit this one out. Praise God. I'd rather have that truth than the guy should feign something uh, and give an impression. The most ethereal worship I have ever heard was in Germany. The Sisters of Mary. They're not Catholic. They're Evangelical Protestant. You know where the worship team is? Not on the platform. In the back in the gallery. You hear their voices, but you don't see them. In fact, even when you encounter them in the way, they're wearing this habit, you know, the way the, Europe, the Germans do, these pietistic movements. All you see is a face. But mamma mia, what a face. It glows. It's radiant. And everything else is rightly concealed. But what is the, the, the mark of saintliness is there to be observed. So I'm saying we need maybe to think these things out and not provide an environment conducive to that which is false, which is feigned, which is an, an, an acting, rather than an authentic statement. And why do we begin that way? Are we ready for worship instantly? The moment we, the, uh, uh, we hit the chairs, maybe we ought to have a silence. Maybe we ought to hear a word first. Maybe the message precedes the worship. I don't know. But let's watch and be careful, lest we program ourselves, and not only program the congregation, through the ecstatic sense that they seem to be experiencing and communicating, but the speaker himself. And how often have I felt in such an environment coming up to the platform, a man completely out of place, completely out of joint. And what I had as a burden from the Lord seems so incompatible with the kind of atmosphere that has been created that has actually come to cue me in to the kind of mood that I should myself express in the speaking. So you see how, how powerful these religious forces are of which we need to be conscious and be willing sacrificially to alter because the issue of truth, reality, righteousness, the powers of the air, the jealousy for the God who is enthroned is every moment at stake. The speaker that is followed is cued in as equally to perform so as not to allow the note of heightened expectancy to be disappointed. In the end, we have created a pseudo-reality, a false reality, of religious ex excitement that must not disappoint the need for, for people who have come for a Sunday fix. If you didn't need a fix, as I've said before, and you're already in 
a daily and right relationship with the Lord, the pressure would not be on so to perform something to give you in, a, in the morning what you're having all the week through. And would enable you to patiently wait for the true thing and go home rejoicing, even in the waiting, if it doesn't come at a particular time. Because God's, God will be there. And something will have promoted your own maturity in that waiting, your own priestliness, that would give the character of this body a sending character that will send and be itself an apostolic entity in reality in Kansas City, where it is so desperately needed. You would be willing for the sacrifice, seeing how great the ends are. So we mustn't neglect God daily and mustn't rig up the services so as to compensate for that kind of neglect that puts the pressure on to perform. And I, I wrote here, how is the pastor apostolic who approves and allows this kind of a setup and whose only motive might be to do it little better than most? I had, uh, here's this apost- man with an apostolic title sitting in front of me, and I know that everything that I'm observing and seeing in his congregation is something that he himself approves or it wouldn't be taking place. But that he would give it his approval and allow the show to go on only to do it more boisterously and loudly and successfully threatens his own, the reality of his own apostolic call. And he needs to see that responsibility. He's responsible for what is allowed to take place. So the issue with Israel and the Jews coming to God in the last days, when Paul says in Romans 10, how shall they call upon him of whom they've not heard? And how shall they hear except one preach? And how shall one preach except he be sent? For faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. These Jews, unbeknownst to themselves, who have been so long removed from their own faith, broken out of their own tree in which we have been grafted in, are waiting for an apostolic word, a sent word, that in the hearing of which faith itself is created. How shall they call upon him of whom they've not heard? And how shall they hear except one preach? And how shall one preach except he be sent? Preaching is holy. The proclamation of the word is, well, I don't have a word for it. It's, it's ultimate calling. There's hearing and hearing and there are words and words. There's four spiritual laws and how to do it and step one and step two has not impressed the Jewish community and I don't know how, who else they it's impressed. But to hear the word of God, not a formula for the gospel, but the word of God that is given to one who is sent from a sending body, whose proclamation of that word actually creates the faith to believe, despite 2,000 years of prejudice against Christ, <coughs> is the very issue for which Israel's salvation waits. And this is entirely lost to our consciousness to the degree that we have not taken Romans chapter 9 through 11 seriously into our hearts. For the issue of Israel and the Jew is the issue of the church. The root cause of all our problems is the neglect or our indifference or ignorance of this mystery and this call that can only be fulfilled by a church which is apostolic, by a church which is jealous for the glory of God, which, by a church which waits by a church which is dependent, by a church that will not initiate, by a church that reveres that which comes down from the throne of heaven as gift from above through waiting. So the experience of his presence already presupposes a deep contemplative prayer life some saint has written. If we want God's presence, we're more likely to enjoy that as the result of a deep contemplative prayer life than something that we can fabricate on a Sunday morning Uh, not having lived in that consciousness in the days that have preceded it. And there are a precious uh, band in every congregation who are suffering, waiting for the thing that I'm describing. And while you are celebrating the worship so-called, they are strangely anguishing and feeling out of it and strangely unable to, to enjoy what is taking place because though they cannot articulate it, their spirit is crying out, for the authentic thing that comes down from above. And they know that there's a contest going on where a great issue is being propounded and being decided Sunday by Sunday, conduct by conduct, 
uh, and they're suffering and anguishing, uh, waiting for that real thing and praying for it. And God sees that suffering and it's filling up in the body what remains of the Lord and he will give answer to it. So if any of you have been anguishing while others seem to be celebrating, the Lord is mindful of you. And your willingness to suffer, waiting in an environment that has chafed your soul will bring an answer to that very congregation. So I encourage you to abide, to remain, to believe and to pray. You are there by the purposes and the will of God and he knows that and he will answer. It's the filling up of the afflictions of Christ for his body's sake, which is the church. For the whole issue of the church is being contested and upheld by that remnant of the faithful who have to anguish waiting patiently for the thing that their souls desire. They alone know that worship is only worship when it is for its own sake and not something calculated to affect an atmosphere. When it has no other motive, however unrecognized, it ceases to be worship and becomes instead the issue of manipulation or control, the celebration of man. We should shrink from the faintest affinity of transforming ourselves by affecting our own atmosphere for the Apostle Paul condemns in Second Corinthians those false apostles who make themselves apostles. So the times are the gift of God entirely. You cannot give them to yourself when you choose. We ought not even to choose it, let alone attempt to produce it. For out of the heart proceed all the issues of life. God will lead us through every barrier into the inner chamber of the knowledge of himself but it will require giving up and relinquishing those traditions and forms and styles that we have ourselves created and enjoyed that become kind of a religious culture and that God will move us into the place by which we ourselves will move Jews to the jealousy for which he waits. The issue of the Jews is the issue of the church. The foundational respect and willingness to wait Sunday by Sunday for that alone which is sent is the issue of that which is apostolic and priestly. The saving word that comes to Israel must be a sent word through a sending body, which I trust and pray you will desire to be. Let me pray for you. I hope that doesn't sound condescending. Because if you will not be that kind of reality, if you have not that intention, if you're not willing for the sacrifice of it, if you want only to be gratified religiously or emotionally, and will not... Be willing to wait for that which comes down from above and that which is sent and received as gift. Where then is it to be expected? If you will not be that people, where, where else shall God look? It's with the church as it is, however faulty, that God must bring to the place of his intention. And my prayer is that these words tonight, however inadequate, will begin to give you a sense of jealousy for that which is authentic and must be given and sent and received as gift by those who patiently wait in priestly waiting. The issues are enormous. Israel's restoration, the coming of the king, the establishment of his rule, his kingdom come, is Sunday by Sunday being propagated, attended, neglected, or set back by the way in which we uh, conduct ourselves. So Lord, precious God, I don't know about these children, but I recognize tonight as being eminently a gift from above. It's a statement of your love, your jealous love, that even it desires something more for us than our own success. It's beyond success. And in fact, it might require <coughs> a certain measure of failure for which we will suffer the reproach and the reprimand of those who will call us foolish for jealously insisting on something that requires us to wait, we could all of the time have been performing something that people would have enjoyed and for which they would have come and for which they would have remained. But Lord, you brought out a nucleus of souls tonight. And I'm asking your blessing upon every precious head, especially the dear ones who are in the front row, whom you've given responsibility for this congregation and whose potential you know for I'm, a, I'm knowing your jealousy for them. Even as my brother has shared with the congregation when we were here last, Art came to us in Phoenix and he said, this is for you. 
David, if others want to overhear, let them. But this is for you. And what was it? It was a call to apostolic stature. Because I know the giftedness of the dear men. We saw it this morning. In, in remarkable preaching and ability. And the danger is that he would succeed in that ability. And fall short of the glory of apostolic fullness that will come even in the relinquishing of that giftedness in the waiting that oftentimes will result in something inferior to what he himself could have performed. That's what, how far God will go to get us to be the real thing. Are we willing for failure? Willing for disappointment? Uh, of our religious expectations? Uh, feeling bored and where's the anointing? If God should lift us and bring us to a dry season in order that we, we should send down roots deep into his life, he has a greater intention for you than you yourselves have. And he's jealous over it tonight and sent a fool to express it. So Lord, my prayer, let not a word fall to the ground for these precious children, for this church and those so many like it, Lord, who have never had a vision of the other set forth before them because it has to come from prophetic men who themselves are feared and few pastors there be who would welcome such a one on their platform lest they rock the boat or, or in any way bring into question the program as it has so successfully been performed till now this man has and the way he prayed in the office for me I said Lord I can't even add a syllable to that prayer answer it he desires and wants your prophetic heart expressed to a prophetic servant. And I believe he's, he's getting it. Bless him, Lord. Give him the courage with his wife to follow on in this direction, my God. And that the glory of God and the presence of God will fill this house. Not when we come and dear it, but when it pleases you to give it as a gift from the throne of heaven. As you will and when you will. For we revere you as the God who alone creates as the God who sends. Seal these words, Lord, and make this the epical turning point for this congregation which you have formed and now are calling into a new uh, cognizance, a new dimension of calling and reality, which is ultimate and will have to do with the restoration of your people Israel and the glory of God in the church. Seal your words. Let them not fall to the ground. No, not one. Let people hear the tape again and again. Let them read the literature that is supportive of this message and be changed. I bless them. Thank you for the privileged time, Lord. Spoil us. Give us a taste of apostolic reality of what it means when one comes to us who is sent and sent to bring a sent word. <clears throat> and that the very issue of our going on from that moment is our willingness <coughs> both to acknowledge and to receive both the man and the message as sent as a gift from the throne of heaven that has come to us which we receive perform that Lord and be gratified in your own soul we thank and give you praise in Jesus name Amen